Welcome everybody to today's City Forum event. If I can hand over to Mark Lee, Chairman of City Forum, for today's introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, delighted to welcome you to the second in this particular series relating to the Pelian principles, which we are asked every three or four years to look at again in the context of current policing. And we've had one session uh, in the series, and, and today we're into sort of Pelian principles, sort of data and, and technology, and we're uh, d delighted to have a remarkable group of sort of conversants. We're chaired by Craig Mackey, who is uh, almost our uh, sort of permanent chairman, I'm d delighted to report, because he sort of guides these conversations with great with great style. Uh, Paul uh, sort of Taylor is speaking for NPCC, and we've had um, a lot of advice uh, from um, uh, the 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 council in developing this um, sort of a p p p particular sort of program, and and we're very grateful for that support. Michael at the Home Office has um, given us a considerable amount of extremely useful advice. And we're delighted, Mike, to have you back on the, this particular occasion. Following uh, Paul and, and 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 Mike, we go on to uh, a contribution by Dave Jackson, with whom we've done lots of pieces of work over the last five or six years, particularly in matters operational. And we're delighted, um, uh, Dave, to see you in your new PDS capacity. Jackie Sabir comes into the sort of conversation. Uh, th then as uh, ACC sort of Bedfordshire and and we're greatly looking forward uh, to to her involvement and then we go on to Andrew Candlish uh, of Cisco who is um, representing the, the, that important organization for us the important organizations for us BT Cisco without whose kindly support it wouldn't be possible to put these forums on at all Andrew, we're delighted to have you as a serious speaker on uh, this this occasion. The first hour will be guided by, uh, by, 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 by Craig. It is sort of on the record. Uh, the speaker's been asked to uh, talk for seven or eight minutes, and uh, so Craig will, will, will sort of guide that part of it. We then go on to, to um, a, 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 a a short, as it were, televisual sort of, sort of interlude, and then on to the um, discussion, which is please off the record. And uh, we, from the speeches and the off the record discussion, we produce a report together with uh, what has been said on the other occasions in this series. Uh, we produce a report under the Chatham House rule, which we hope will be of useful of use to to chiefs, to PCCs, to politicians and to others. BT Cisco has been our main sponsor for this series. We're delighted today to have with us Motorola and also to have with us sort of Accenture, which have helped us frequently in the past. And we're delighted to, to see you here, here again. Craig, it will be a good conversation led by you. You arrived with the most remarkable jacket, which left us all sort of Envious of you for your sartorial style, you've gone quiet taking your jacket off. But I'm sure you won't be quiet in the conversations. We look forward to a session guided by you. I think you're one of the best chairmen there is. Delighted to have you. Thank you for your support of City Forum. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, um, my sartorial elegance has changed slightly uh, as we go on this afternoon. But first of all, welcome everyone to this in terms of what we're going to do this afternoon. I would urge all of you as we go through listening to the speakers in the first part, please use the meeting chat. Um, put questions, put comments in there. We'll pick them up from there and we'll feed them in as we go along. As Mark said, this is the second in a series of events, and it's it is a it's a really important time to look at these issues for policing, issues of legitimacy, communities, leadership, police performance. How do we know what communities want? These are always current, but they're never more current than at the moment. 
uh, in terms of, of what poli the challenges policing faces at the moment. So I'm really fortunate to be joined by a, a, an excellent panel of experts for whom the issues we're talking about today are their day to day business. I will help, but I need your help as well as an audience. I will push them to talk about solutions as well as uh, defining the problem. Um, we can spend a lot of time defining problems, but I'll push it. What are the solutions? What can we do differently? How can we help and how can we improve things for citizens and colleagues uh, working in this sector? So please roll up your sleeves, start your questions and we'll move to our first speaker. I'm very, very pleased to be joined by uh, Professor Paul Taylor, who's the Chief Scientific Advisor, new Chief Scientific Advisor to NPCC. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, one of my favourite stories first told uh, by the wonderful Paul Rawkins concerns Einstein's sabbatical at Oxford. He'd just set the uh, advanced physics paper and his uh, TA comes running up to Einstein in a bit of a panic, worrying, I, Dr Einstein, you've set the same questions as you did in last year's exam paper and all of our students have access to those past papers. To which Einstein says, please, please don't worry, the answers have changed. In other words, what has got us here to today is not what is going to get us uh, to tomorrow within policing. So when I think of the Pelian principles, when we best want to meet those principles, what we have done in the past to meet those principles is not going to meet them as we strive forward to meet them in the future. And I think that's a very important underpinning lesson to the conversations that we need to have today. Digital data and technology is probably at the forefront of that change, of that desire to bring efficiency in new uh, and in exciting ways. And it covers a whole variety of things, of course, from modern replacements of systems that have been with us to, for a long time, uh, to demand management capabilities that work behind policing to allow us to be more efficient. So for examples of that being Lancashire Voices project, where we took the 1.2 million uh, 999 and 112 calls that are received per year, and through some voice to text technology and some natural language processing, we're able to begin to dissect exactly what was going on in those calls and how we could better manage that process and give a better service to the public. And from those backroom capabilities to what I call more front room capabilities, where uh, we are using digital and technology proactively to help us identify and prevent harm. An example of that being the wonderful work that the Thames Valley Violence Reduction Unit do in bringing together data from across the government spectrum, from schools, from communities, from health, from other sectors into one place where we can begin to look at the signs that might mean that children uh, uh, have the potential to be in harm's way and we can do something about it. So the breadth of the efficiency, the pillion efficiency that technology can offer us for tomorrow as opposed to where we've got to today, it is really, really important. There are two other things that I think it's worth flagging in this opening that are, are, are core to Pelian principles, and I think core to our discussion around digital data and technology. The first is legitimacy. The public's approval of our use of data, of our use of technology, uh, is paramount to policing, and everybody I have met since I joined six months ago feels that way. It is critical that we should be clear and transparent about everything we do as much as possible we do. And it actually is very much a tenant of my role. So I advocate for open science where we provide our results, we present our data, we allow others to scrutinise and indeed build on it to our advantage. So that that postdoc in Glasgow University, who I've never met, can come up with a new way of helping us do violence reduction and, and uh, and support the public through to committees such as the Science Advisory Council that I've just put into place, which allow us to uh, scrutinise and hopefully give the public some reassurance that our use of digital and data and technology is uh, being looked at by uh, the world's best experts in a variety of areas. And of course, on that legitimacy point, let us not forget that technology itself has become a point of contact. 
we've had wonderful successes across policing in the last few years in using social media as a way of allowing the public to engage with police and it was a very fundamental part of the Pelian principles and what I, I find really exciting about that is there's lots of shift from 999 to WhatsApp is that it's, a, it's reaching a different demographic there are people who feel more comfortable engaging with the police on social media than they do through a traditional phone line and that's fantastic that we're able to open up our legitimacy and our communications by using these different forms of technology. The third thing that I want to end with that I think at least implicitly is in the Pelian principles, if it's not explicit, is that we should in policing and the community that we work with and for should be at one. We should do things together. There is no way that policing is going to achieve this digital data and technical journey on its own. It has to do it in partnership. It has to work with industry, it has to work with academia, and it has to work with the public who can understand what we're going, what we're trying to achieve and guide us on how best we uh, do that. That involves opening up, that involves having conversations from the beginning. So that those of you who work in academia and industry on the call can understand truly what the challenges are that we face. And so that we can understand truly what you offer us in the digital data and technology space. That's why today's event, events like today are so useful. They're a conversation that we can have and they're one of many conversations that I know all of us across policing are really keen to have. So what has got us here will not get us there. And I hope today's conversation will unpack some of what can get us there, what can accelerate us to there and what can leave us so that digital data and technology does police efficiency being the absence of crime and disorder. Thanks very much. Paul, thank you. Um, I, you've set some really exciting themes to start, and one of those is about what's going to get us there, and probably no better segue into to Michael, Michael Hill, uh, from the Home Office with the work you're doing. To some extent, uh, the scene's been set, Michael, you're the man who's going to get us there on some of the big programmes. So uh, over to you. Thank you, Craig. Um, so I joined the Home Office almost two years ago, indeed, two years ago next month. And what a two years it has been. Obviously, the majority of which has been the time span of the pandemic, engaging through a screen, although I managed to get a few events to meet people face to face, which has been great. It's been a fascinating, challenging and interesting and rewarding two years. And I'm relatively new to policing, having reviewed the Pelian principles, I believe they remain as relevant today as they did back in 1829 when first devised. A number of those certainly resonate with me in the current situation facing policing, which can be badged under the banner of trust and confidence, three of which being public approval of existence, securing and maintaining public respect, to seek and preserve public favour and the relationship with the public, police are the public and public are the police. As Martin stated a few weeks ago, that although the vast majority of the public have trust in the police, there is a significant minority who would answer differently, and a small number of high-profile cases have exacerbated this situation recently. In my career, I've come to realise that trust is built and reinforced through successful delivery, meeting commitments that are made and delivering highly effective services. In the policing context, this is equally applicable, serving our communities effectively day in and day out, protecting them from harm, but procedural justice is important too. For example, if police deliver an efficient service but fail to recognise the human elements, such as empathy when dealing with victims, or taking the time to explain why an officer is using stop and search powers to the person they have stopped, then this too can have impact on public trust and confidence. Digital data and technology is intrinsic to modern policing, therefore I argue in the, to the present day realisation of the PLEM principles and I could wax lyrical about DDAT all day, but I've only seven minutes, so I best crack on. So therefore, I'd like to focus on the Pelian principle of prevent and how national systems and the data within them can support the prevention of crime. Using data analytics to pre better predict crime identifies those at risk and those representing a threat, at times using nudge principles in support of the prevent agenda. Earlier in my career, I was a district councillor and supported communities on the Speedwatch initiative, protecting roads and communities from speeding drivers sending letters on policing letterhead to influence and deter. More recently, the op-tutelage work that is bringing together multiple data sets to identify uninsured vehicles on our roads, owners of which receive a letter, has had a significant impact on compliance. 
and indeed the ongoing Cheshire Police Op Yellow Card initiative, which disrupts and deters crime from within the county, again using data from national systems, systems to identify criminality. These are but a few examples, and I'm sure there are many, many other great initiatives ongoing across law enforcement. From a Home Office perspective, we are using data to gain a greater understanding and effective presentation of offender patterns, trends and characteristics. This will help not only policy development, but also enable operational impact. All are great examples of how data can support the prevent principle. Whilst we are at the beginning to realise the opportunities data presents, however, data is still largely siloed and there's a culture of not sharing by default. And this is exacerbated by the federated structures of policing. In law enforcement, we're not alone in this, though. Consider the challenges across the public sector with legacy structures, systems and culture. The NHS springs to mind. However, within law enforcement, we are tackling this through the policing digital strategy. We need to realise the benefit this will bring. And it's a challenge I know ourselves and the police digital service are well up for. Within the Home Office, we are aligning to the digital strategy. We are putting in place the foundations which unlock the value of data. We are creating an open architecture which increases sustainability, extensibility and looks for opportunities to reduce costs and drives digital and data transformation of the services both within the Home Office, but also at regional and local levels. And it's very much aligned to the law enforcement capability model work that is ongoing as well. This will not only reduce time and cost, critically, it will also reduce operational risk, getting information to the to where it is urgently need required delivered to handheld devices and indeed ESN in the future. This approach combined with the changes we have made to how we are delivering national programmes such as NLP will get capability into the hands of users quicker. We are designing with the user front and centre. We're empowering serving police officers to make decisions, prioritise roadmaps and to be part of our programme leadership teams. We're moving away from a customer supplier dynamic towards a true partnership built on collaboration and trust. This will provide more certainty of delivery. However, delivery is only half the story. Adoption is the other half. Colleagues on this call will know this is a subject dear to my heart and it would be remiss of me not to take the opportunity to mention it. We are supporting adoption through the provision of funding and expertise. However, we need to engage effectively and adopt the earliest opportunity, game-changing capabilities such as NAS and in the future, LEDs. The adoption of these capabilities and the utilising the data effectively brings us full circle back to prevent, enabling scarce physical resources to be in the right place at the right time to prevent and apprehend. And if we look at the Pareto role, effective use of data will get us probably to about 80% there, the final 20% being the deployment of physical resources as appropriate. Counterintuitively, prevent is at its most effective when you cannot see it aligning to the final Pillian principle. The absence of crime and disorder enables confidence, builds trust in our police forces from an, all aspects of our society. And if those who created the principles nearly 200 years ago could see the world today, they would not recognize the challenges that modern policing face. However, they would recognize the bravery and dedication inherent within policing, which I feel is still aligned to the vision for the Pillian principles established in 1829. So digital data and technology are intrinsic, as I say, to modern day policing. And specifically, our vision for Triple PT is enabling operational impact through effective delivery. And I'm very proud of the part my team play in protecting the most vulnerable in society from harm. So thank you. Michael, thank you. And, and some really powerful stuff in there, um, which segues nicely into um, uh, uh, David, Dave Jackson. Um, welcome. Um, you have a wealth of experience of trying to do legacy systems, digital change. You've changed roles now. You're you're at PDS. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Craig. And thank you also to Paul and Michael, who, uh, without any conferring prior to today's call, have managed to set me up absolutely wonderfully. Uh, I'm going to start, actually, uh, just reflecting back on uh, a point that Paul made right at the very start of uh, his slot, uh, where he talks about how digital data and technology is now absolutely intrinsic and synonymous with our everyday lives, not in policing, but across the UK and global population. And I was reminded as he was speaking about a business continuity planning uh, exercise that uh, I took part in about 18 months ago, 
where the business continuity planner just said, right, your first risk to consider is there is no internet. And all of a sudden, as I looked around the room and the look of sort of realization on people's faces, as they actually realized if there was no connectivity, how much of their individual lives would be disrupted. Uh, and, and actually, I think that's a really, really important point because we are coming at a very, very mature, connected uh, context, uh, connected communities in many, many different ways. There's a famous story uh, circulating around Whitehall uh, from the pandemic where a Whitehall colleague carried out some engagement with some young people aged between 15 and 19 on a platform like Teams or Zoom. It doesn't matter which one. Not one of the participants turned their camera on, not one of the participants spoke, and the entire two hour consultation was carried out solely by text in the chat bar. And that's really important for me because that reminds me the, the, the communities and the public that we serve in policing today are changing. The way in which we communicate with each other is changing. And I think we are standing absolutely on the edge of a real opportunity which we can seize uh, without actually um, necessarily undermining any of the Pelian principles. Um, I read a really good book a couple of years ago by an author called Thomas Friedman. Uh, and he wrote this book called Thank You for Being Late uh, back in 2016. Uh, and if you haven't read it, jolly good book to read. But he uh, references Eric Teller, who for a while was the head of um, of Google's or Google's parent company's uh, Futurology and Development Department. And Eric came up with a graph and says at the moment uh, we are standing uh, at the crossroads of the rate of change of technology being so acute, it is now exceeded human's adaptability to be able to change to it. And actually, I think that's what we are starting to see, particularly in the rate of some of the futures technology that we are seeing, is that many humans, not just people in policing, but generally, are starting to struggle to adapt to the rate of that change. And I sort of paraphrase that by saying, uh, when I'm working with colleagues uh, and speaking about digital data and technology futures, is just because technology could do something, we need to ask ourselves, but should we? And that's a really important point, because whatever we, wherever technology goes in terms of innovation, in terms of adaptation, et cetera, we as leaders in this space, we need to reflect carefully on whether just because something is bigger, is faster, is quicker, whether it actually is right for the context in which we are operating in uh, and whether it's right for the public we serve. As a senior police officer, I had the absolute honour to welcome new student officers into the organisation uh, many, many times. And I used to tell them a story about, um, uh, about why policing is different to, say, going out for your grocery shopping. Uh, and the story I used to tell was, if you go to a, a particular supermarket and you know what you want, you go in there, but the store is dirty, the staff are rude, they haven't got the products you want, it doesn't matter there are 11 other supermarket chains you could go to. But in policing, if if we aren't at the top of our game in terms of uh, interacting and, and, and dealing with the public, there is no other choice. So it's important, as uh, the previous speakers have said, we absolutely take the public with us on this journey. Um, and uh, I think that actually, as we start to socialise some of the new capabilities that exist within data and within technology, it is absolutely incumbent on us to have that conversation that not only describes, but actually shows, actually tells. It allows those people who are naturally very interested in this sort of thing to understand exactly what it is. Uh, that we are looking to trial or to introduce, why we are looking to trial or introduce something, how we are going to do it, and have that open and honest conversation. And one area I want to concentrate on um, comes from actually the background from where I come from most recently, uh, where working with Craig, um, I used to uh, um, be in charge of the Met's contact uh, centres across London. Now, demand coming into policing continues to rise year on year. It's around about the 7% mark. Uh, 
And just reflecting back on Paul's point from earlier, um, quite rightly, he, he outlines the great strides that policing have taken nationally to open up new channels of contact. So uh, contact by the website, contact by social media. What's really important there, uh, and I don't know if, if Paul is aware of this, but 80% of that contact would not have come in by telephone. We know that. So we know that the public want to be in different areas. We know that the public want to be um, uh, communicate with us differently. But of course, servicing that additional demand means that we are potentially going to have to put more people in uh, and quite a significant investment to be able to respond to those incoming contacts in a timely way. However, of course, automation is a really, really efficient and effective use of technology if it's done correctly. Now, a lot of people are uh, quite rightly concerned around the role of automation and particularly automated decision making. Uh, do we want computers making decisions about people? Well, my personal view is in certain circumstances, that's a good thing. But we need to be very, very careful around when we allow technology to make decisions about people and particularly how far that technology uh, is involved in that decision. Is it a completely technological decision? Is it a completely human decision? Or is it a blend of the technology helping the human come to a decision? This is not a new phenomenon. Back in 1978, two American researchers wrote a groundbreaking paper uh, around undersea operations. Sheridan and Furplank were two researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and came up with a 10 point scale of the role of computers making decisions to augment the human decision making process. And I think if we look right the way back to the late 70s, as policing starts to consider the role of automation and when automation might be used to take over from manual efforts, um, and how far it takes over from manual effort in terms of decision making, that would be a good place for us to start having a look at how much we want to harness the efficiency and the effectiveness uh, of technology to help keep policing both efficient and effective in itself. And I think the final point really for me is, is back to a point that we've all made. Uh, and probably back to Paul's point, we are not going to do this alone. Mike made the same point. I'm firmly on the same page as, as well. We have lots of people uh, from all sorts of different walks of life that are willing, able and capable to help policing have this conversation around the future of digital data and technology. We have the capability to build um, synthetic environments so we can demonstrate, so we can explain, so we can reassure. And I think by adopting an open, transparent and forward looking future, working with our partners, our suppliers and our communities, we will be able to harness much of the opportunity that the future of digital data and technology offers us, whilst at the same time not undermining the uncertainty uh, that starts to erode really important points like trust and confidence in policing. Thank you. David, thank you. Some some really thought provoking uh, points there. And I just urge comments. Keep the uh, colleagues, keep those comments coming in uh, and observations as we move into questions. Very pleased now to, to, to move on to uh, Assistant Chief Constable Jackie Sabir. Jackie, you've heard a lot about the ideas and thinking. How do we make some of this real in an area that's going to affect communities that we serve uh, on a daily basis? Lovely. Thanks, Craig. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you to City Forum for, for the invite. Um, can I ask for the slides to go up, please? Super, thank you very much. So you, you may uh, wonder what a Assistant Chief Constable from Bedfordshire is doing talking to you today. Um, so up until very recently, I was the MPCC Serious Violence Lead. And as, as I've just handed that portfolio over, having done it for three and a half years, I, I think I, I wanted to share some reflections on that and look at how police can influence the digital environment in which serious violence is, is encouraged. So um, if we move on to the next slide, please. So I think it's worthwhile just taking a moment to think about how the digital environment actually does encourage serious violence 
And if we distill that down into sort of three areas, it's through feuds, it's through fear, and it's through the facilitation of, of criminal enterprise. So if we just go to the next slide, please, and we'll have a little look on, on the feud section first. So this young man is a, a young man, a 19 year old man called Isaac Stone, and I'll explain his story after we've just run the video. So if you wouldn't mind just showing the video for a few moments. So that slide, that little bit of YouTube clip was probably about 20 seconds. That 20 seconds in 2014 led to Isaac's death. Isaac was a 19 year old uh, lad living in Bedfordshire and he posted that video on Friday the 24th of January. Um, within 24 hours he had been stabbed to death by a rival gang because I don't know if you missed the clip but there was alcohol being thrown over a tag that said Raz that annoyed that group. So they went and bought uh, a 299 meat cleaver, hired a Range Rover and then went and stabbed him to death within 24 hours of that video being posted. So that just goes to show how social media and there are, as you know, many, many other stories like Isaac's. Um, but that just goes to show you how quickly social media enables these feuds to um, explode um, and have fatal consequences. So how else does digital environment lead to serious violence? If we move to the next slide, please. And this is about fear. So this is our uh, previous uh, PCC. And I think we, we can be under no illusions that violence is political. There's lots of um, wanting to show how we are dealing seriously with serious violence to reassure the public. So we have lots of pictures of knives being found, guns being found, drugs being taken off the streets. And there's some real mixed evidence around how this actually leads to fear within the communities and young people. Um, it actually leads subconsciously to trauma. And I've spoken to young people that see these pictures of knives that think, hey, well, that means I've got to have a knife because everybody's carrying a knife. Or actually people will see knives like this thinking, well, actually my kitchen knife ain't gonna do that, so I need a bigger knife. So again, I think we have to think really carefully and get a much better evidence base around why and how and in what forum we show these knives so that we manage the fear and the trauma it can perpetuate for young people especially. So if we move on to the final um, way that social uh, digital encourages violence, it's through the facilitation of criminal enterprise. And I don't need to tell you that this audience about the complex encryption, um, something like Operation Venetic was able to solve, um, but it facilitates end to end high value uh, drug use. And then you have Nokia's like this, which your street dealers will use. So it, in, it allows buying opportunities for weapons and drugs. It allows dealing opportunities to take place. And whilst we've spoken primarily around street violence, we must never forget it facilitates domestic abuse and stalking as well in, in, a, in a way that we could never ever have imagined perpetrators being able to use before. So if we move to the next slide, please, and trying to bring this together with some of the, the talk that you've already heard from my other colleagues on the panel, I, I think this, this quote actually really sums up what I think. Um, it, uh, Klaus Schwab has said that we are seeing this revolution, this fourth industrial revolution that looks about how we are fundamentally changing the way we live, work and relate to one another. And I would in that add in there how we police. Artificial intelligence is changing notions of consent and privacy and the role of policing in that. And whilst I think we can look at the prim uh, the Pelian, prim uh, Pelian principles. Obviously, previous colleagues on the panel have said that they think they're fit for purpose. I'm not quite so sure. I think there is a real issue to think about consent. We police by consent. Do the public consent in the way we use their data? And I think there's some really honest and difficult conversations that we need to have. And the other thing I believe that we need to think about with Pelian principles, Peel came in in the Industrial Revolution. We are in a digital revolution. Pelian principles led to a style of hierarchical policing, of command and control and of top 10 lists and of playing this whack-a-mole of let's get this video off social media. 
PM principles do not look at flat line management. They do not look at much more agile management and, and risk um, risk taking leadership. So I think there is a real step in time now to be thinking about how the the uh, Pelium principles led policing down one avenue and now with this technical revolution we need to be thinking about different ways of leadership and policing especially moving on from some of what has worked before and to do that if we move to the next slide here are three things that I think police can really act on to influence these digital environments to, to how we manage this fourth technical revolution so firstly there's something about how we enable policing for those colleagues that are listening in on the front line, they will be very um, they will recognise this phrase that most police officers say that we have yesterday's technology today. Policing is so cumbersome. Our contract negotiations are so laden with difficulties that I don't think we we use digital at all in the ways that we should do at the moment or in the opportunities that it can give us. How are we using cloud based services compared to on on premises digital services is a really important discussion that forces all need to be having. How do we insource compare with outsource and how do we agile collaborate with startups? They all involve risk, but actually we need to be risk takers to enable some of these opportunities that this Pandora's box of technology has allowed us. Paul already mentioned about data sharing and big data. Wouldn't it be amazing if we have absolutely, we don't need to keep rowing about data sharing with our partners and we can actually understand where our paramedics hotspots are compared to our policing crime hotspots and not have to jump through a load of hoops to try and get that information shared. We, and you can see lots of smiles on the call. You know all are familiar with this, but it's a nut we do not seem to be able to crack quickly enough in the way the public would expect us to. So there's something very much about enabling and embracing that enabling technology for policing. Also for me, there's I'm really passionate about bringing people with lived experience within the organisation. So I, we've already heard the story about young people communicating through texts um, on the chat bars rather than actually speaking to one another. How do we bring in um, people with convictions into our um, organisation that will help us understand how they use technology without having to jump through the bars of vetting? How can we, you know, how can we bring these two things together to get those people that actually have lived experience to know what it's like to be stalked, um, harassed, domestically abused or a victim and suspect in crime so we can understand how they use technology much, much better and share with them what we want to do. And also there's that bit about recruitment. Policing budgets don't necessarily bring in the brightest and the best at all times and keep us there and retain them. So again, how do we look at recruiting uh, the brightest and the best or collaborating with the brightest and the best? And then just finally, I, I did have a wry smile. There's definitely something about education and communication. How do we educate the public in, in what we do? And, and we've spoken about signposting and WhatsApp and Twitter. Well, I've been in discussions this morning about taking WhatsApp and Twitter away from officers. So we, we give with one hand, we commit with one thing saying we should have Twitter and WhatsApp because that's what the public expect. But because we either don't trust our officers, um, we're worried about what happens or actually we're worried about the tech and the encryption and how um, the security of that. We need to commit to one or the other or just be bold the public would expect that to us. So if we're going to educate and use various different platforms for external signposting about what we're doing, we need to commit to that and make sure they work. And there's the internal sharing of best practice. I mean, I think it's fantastic what Paul and the team will be doing, but we need to fail fast. We need to share best practice and build on what works. We know so many times we'll get a new leader in or a new boss in and sweep away what's worked before to bring in new things. Actually, a lot of stuff does work. We know what works. So it's how can we embed that and build on what works then rather than completely start again at all times. So this enable experience and educate program all needs really courageous and vulnerable leadership. We need our leaders to admit they don't know the answers. They don't know everything and the ability to test and not be afraid to fail and embrace to do embrace things differently. And to do that, we need really diverse and agile leadership. So I think, Craig, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'm sure hopefully we'll have some questions later on in the panel. Jackie, thank you. I'm sure there will. Some, some really, really interesting points there. The first person who said, does Peel need refreshing, if I may paraphrase, for a, for a modern age? 
and that interesting issue about what is consent and when is real consent uh, in terms of, uh, of what people can do. So really, really thank you. It gives me great pleasure now to move to, to Andrew Candlish. Andrew is from Cisco, one of our, our sponsors today, and it's interesting to hear what the industry, what the sector uh, feels about this, Andy, you know, in terms of, go on, you've heard some of the story. What do you think? You're on mute, Andy. OK, there we go. That's brilliant, isn't it? There, there's the technical guy in the room who uh, who can't organise the mute button. Uh, first of all, th thanks, everyone, for um, uh, for, for letting us um, have a few minutes. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I'm sure many of you know um, Cisco or have heard of Cisco. Um, we're, I guess, the plumbers of the Internet. We we kind of invented it and 95 percent of the forces um, use our technology and our, our, our network. Um, I think we we would feel that we, um, you know, the, the support support operational policing and and our network underpins everything. It's funny that that thing about Pelion. I, I was I, I was um, I was having a little read uh, earlier on, and of course, you know, we, we talk about the internet revolution in the same way that we talked about the industrial revolution back then, and it, and it is interesting how we've kind of come full circle with the internet revolution and. I guess the last 18 months has showed us all um, that we need to go back to a bit of a human side, I think. So let, let, let me start by saying all of our work at the moment is, is desperately trying to create um, an idea of what the future of hybrid work looks like. So we've, we're plumbers and we've been plumbing people's internet and connectivity into offices, into um, uh, um, uh, small offices, large offices, contact centres, and now we're bringing the home in and the complexity around delivering a, a consistent user experience is so, so difficult. Um, how many times have you been on a, a Zoom or a meetings or a WebEx where, you know, some people have good, good experience, some not, we all blame the broadband. The truth is it's so complicated. We all use 20 different clouds you know we've we've got the amazons and the googles and the microsofts we've got the saps we've got we've got 20 of them and the business of plumbing them all together and then delivering into the home into a uh, a small office or a main office is really hard so the big work we're doing at the moment is is helping helping customers and it it doesn't really matter who they are just work out how to do the plumbing, how to do the plumbing and put some intelligence in. You've touched on so many things. Um, I love the AI and ML discussion. Um, we, we use AI, I guess, a lot because there's so much data and um, uh, analytics that we see on the network. But the, the, the business of AIing a network to the home we, we often compare it to you know, solving a crime. We, we use lots of analogies, but the inputs and the feeds that come into us um, are huge. And then in the end, we need detectives and doctors at the front who can actually make some sense out of it. So that you can't do it all on, on AI. There's always a mixture of AI and, and human. And even on something that you would have thought could be so AIable, you wouldn't believe the amount of human that we also encounter trying to get the plumbing right. So the, um, the, the job that we do at the moment is we're, we're plumbers and we're out there every day trying to, trying to get the, the internet and connectivity into the home to create a consistent user experience. I love that question of imagine if the internet stopped working, you know, that's, that's kind of what we, we do every day. Um, but away from the technical bit, so, so, so we're out there in the vans every day doing the plumbing. Um, the bit that I'm, I'm most interested in is the human bit. And we, we've got a lot, of, um, a lot of customers talking to us about hybrid work. OK, let's talk about the plumbing. But what about the environment? What about the, the business of 
the blend of home working, office working, what's it going to be in the future? Because I, I think a year ago, we were probably all convinced that this was going to be a blip. Uh, let's let's get everyone working from home as best we can, and then we'll all toddle off back to the office. It's pretty clear that that's just not going to happen now. So there's now a big discussion, and we, we've got some really interesting offices. We were at the start of the sort of the Google generation of table tennis tables and skateboards and dogs in the office and all this sort of stuff. And actually, what what we've now created is is an environment that that allows hybrid work, allows allows free flow of people in and out. Um, and all the technology and, and this type of technology, we, we of course have WebEx um, and, and the ability to have that consistent experience. That's kind of what we're educating everyone in now. So we've we've we spend most of our time just showing people our offices and looking at the, the tech that we have and just saying, yep, yeah, that allows us to do that. And then if you wander off and go home, that's consistent. And this is how it looks. And a lot of it is human. Um, so we're, we're spending so much of our time now doing the connectivity, but also trying to educate of how hybrid work works. And obviously the policing is a, a very unique service. Um, I don't know how you bring in early in career and apprentices when when you're so much away from an office. Um, we, we've, we've got 60 apprentices every year that come in and um, they've never been in an office. They're in their second year and they've never, ever been in an office. We've got guys in our team who've never met us. And it's mad. <laughs> and so the, these sorts of things are, are what we're trying to solve with, with a hybrid work. What does that mean? And, and how do you create a consistent experience for everyone and um and it's fascinating i'd have to say i think we're we're sort of hybrid consultants more than we are as, as much as we are plumbers i would say at the moment um and it's and how you police and how you how you manage to get cohorts of early and career people through in this new world that's a fascinating one i would just say i think we we've got a lot we could probably help you with um and i'd encourage just to to ask all your all, all your people to come in and have a look at what we do just in terms of culture and working. You know, if we do your plumbing, but look at the culture and working. I think you'd be amazed what sort of things we're doing now in that. Um, so that would be my that would be my thought for the day. I had 15 other things written down, but um, that's that that's about me. Thank you. Andy, thank you. And I'm sure some on the call will take you up on that offer in terms of the uh, uh, the ability to come in and see. I know from work I'm doing as an exec, many organisations and Jackie touched on it in, in her presentation, talking about how they deliver bits of the service beyond the front end of the service and, and thinking about different ways of doing it. So really, really useful. Thank you for that. And there are things I'm sure we'll come back to in the question. It, at, at this point, I'm just going to ask, there's a short video to play from Motorola and then I'll ask Ian uh, to contribute. But if we could see the video. With Pronto Digital Policing, officers have a number of tools available to facilitate effective victim management during and post incident. When a key witness is unable to remain at the scene of the incident and needs to be contacted to give her statement, Officers can follow up with a telephone conversation with the witness, recording the statement. The officer sends the statement via Pronto to the witness for electronic signing. This is accessed through a secure portal. If the witness has relevant photo or video evidence, a secure web link sent via email enables them to upload their files. All signed statements and files are immediately accessible in Pronto and RMS by the Prisoner Handling Team. When a witness at the scene gives their statement, they can sign their statement electronically on the officer's Pronto device. If they too have evidence, a QR code can be generated within the crime workflow, allowing the witness to scan the code directly and upload media files, which are then automatically linked to the incident. The witness's statements and evidence are then immediately and securely sent 
via Command Central Community to Command Central Evidence. They are safely stored and managed together with the crime workflow and made available immediately during incident management, investigation and consultation with prosecutors during case building. Pronto Digital Policing allows vital evidence and witness testimony to be collated, stored and managed in a streamlined and completely secure environment. Thank you, Ian. Perhaps a comment, an observation on what, what you've seen from, from your perspective? Yeah, thank you, Craig. I, I think some really interesting points made uh, thus far. And it's, it's interesting to see the, 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 the comment by uh, Jacqueline as well about what perhaps needs to change in the Pelian principles. Um, hadn't really thought of it from that side of it. Um, play, playing that, that uh, video was quite deliberate because I wanted to uh, really link technology to, to the Pelian principles. Uh, and I just wanted to call out two of the Pelian principles. Uh, number three, which is uh, securing the willing cooperation of the public. And also number seven, which is probably the most commonly quoted one, which is the police of the public and the public of the police. But actually that, that one starts with um, the wording uh, to maintain at all times the relationship with the public, to give reality to that relationship. And I think those two principles in particular link in to the video that you've just seen in the way that we've helped our customers and in fact the way the customers have asked us to really deliver particularly in the times of you know the, the, the pandemic how, how our customers have asked us to deliver that engagement in a different way in today's modern world where everybody's mobile savvy and actually let's face it how the public really want to communicate most people now they want to do their communications whether it's with friends or business or with the police or anything else they want to do it via a mobile phone and i think that's what we're starting to see now is that uh, policing customers in particular are asking us for new ways of engagement to to really bring that all up to date so that we're not asking people back to police stations or having to visit their home or having to go to their place of work. Um, so I, I think that's, I, I just wanted to put that out there in terms of what is already out there before I led it on to the, to the first question, which was, where do you think some of the gaps are that enable police forces to really uphold those Pelian principles in today's, um, today's modern mobile era? Ian, thank you. And it, it falls on me to, to, to just summarise. I, I... For, for those on, on who've taken part this afternoon, a really, really big thank you. Uh, I suspect, like uh, like me, some of you felt like digital luddites when you heard that Andy had got seventy connected devices in his house. <laughs> I was I was busy counting away in the background, thinking I must get that fridge on the internet now um, <laughs> to, to boost my numbers up. But no, to, to all of you for the contributions, thank you. Really, really powerful. And a really, really important debate. Um, uh, you see by some of the comments in the in the sidebar uh, how important and, and how valuable it is as we wrestle with these challenges going forward. None of these would be possible without the sponsors. So it, it's a big thank you to the sponsors who've helped this afternoon. We couldn't do any of this without the support of sponsors. Uh, and thank you to those who've both participated uh, and those who've been in the background in terms of, of, of what they've done and supported it. And, and Mark and the team, and I'll hand back to you, Mark, to, to, to draw us to a close. But I know uh, the team at City Forum do an awful lot of work pulling these together and, and shepherding us uh, into place. I hope we've done justice to what is uh, an important and dynamic subject. And thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, uh, so I don't think Mark will join us at this point uh, in terms of it. But thank you to everyone for taking part today. Uh, and thank you for your contributions. If there's things you don't think are picked up, please, please put it in the uh, uh, in the chat and, and we'll pick it up and make sure it's it's reflected in the feedback. But on my behalf, Thank you, everyone, for their contributions this afternoon. Really, really good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank Thanks you, Craig. Very much. Thanks, Cheers. Craig. Bye-bye.